Well, I'm being told that we've started recording and that the webinar has started. So hopefully you will all have had time to, to join us and get your morning coffee and sit down and delve into what should be a really interesting webinar. So hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar, um, Climate Change Bites, which will delve into exactly how climate change is driving the emergence and spread of animal, human and plant diseases that are transmitted by insects and ticks ticks being arachnids and not insects, which is something I found out only recently. So that's your first takeaway fact for a particularly biologically savvy pub, pub quiz that you have after this event. Anyway, a, a very warm welcome from me. It's lovely to see so many of you um, online today. Sorry that we can't be together in person. The pervading results of the ongoing pandemic, which um, the theme of this webinar will speak to quite a lot today, the link between our changing environment and disease risk. But I think you're gonna be treated to a fascinating discussion. I'm your host and your chair, um, and I will, staring at my laptop screen, try and muddle the way up my way through that. My name is Victoria Gill. I'm a science correspondent from BBC News. I've been a science journalist for longer than I'd care to mention, and I have actually interviewed um, a few people that you'll be hearing from today in my efforts to report on science and environment for TV, radio, and online. Um, today, you're gonna hear some presentations from a really excellent group of scientists. Um, and then we're going to invite a few more equally excellent scientists onto our virtual stage for a panel discussion. Um, and that will take up about half of our two hour event. So about half of it is going to be um, our fascinating presentations. And then we're going to move on to a panel discussion and try and keep it as interactive as possible. So I hope all of these presentations are going to inspire all of you to ask some questions, because what we really want to do is to make this as interactive as possible for everyone here. Um, speaking of which, a little bit of Zoom housekeeping before we start. This event is being recorded. You might have heard um, a little notification of that. We're hoping to make that recording available online for all of you um, to, to revisit, but also for people that weren't able to make it today. Um, hopefully, most of you will be pretty familiar with Zoom. Um, I know I'm all too familiar with it, given how ubiquitous it's become during uh, the last 18 months. Uh, because some of our presenters will be using different functions of Zoom, including the poll function during their presentations and um, maybe asking you a quick question about how much you might know or your views on a particular topic so that we can get some audience interaction there. Um, so keep your eye on that. You will also have the opportunity to submit your questions via the Q&A function. Um, so do submit, do have a look along the, the bottom of the screen, have a look for your Q&A function and submit any questions that pop up there. Um, I'll try and keep a note as chair. We've got a list of questions that already came in. And what we're going to do is save those for the panel session at the end so that we can keep this as interactive as possible. Um, this isn't a lecture. As I said, it's an interactive session. So please also feel free to use the chat function to discuss the topics that you're here to find out more about. And if you want to take to social media some, for some very intellectual social currency boosting, please do. If you're tweeting about the event, um, do use our hashtag, which is Climate Change Bites. I think one of the team from UKRI will be putting that in the chat now. Um, now, just brief, briefly before I introduce our first scientist presenter, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the organiz organizations that have brought everyone together today and kindly invited me to host. Um, you're going to hear five presentations about current ongoing research that's revealing just how climate change and disease are intrinsically linked. Our changing climate is a ticking time bomb. It's altering the Earth's climate and weather, resulting in extreme and unpredictable weather patterns, droughts, flooding, and heat wave. And it's a key factor contributing to biodiversity loss and changes in populations of species of insects and ticks. And some of those are carriers or vectors of disease causing pathogens. That's already influencing the habitats, the distribution, the life cycles of all of these vectors in unpredictable ways, but ways that make them potentially more likely to transmit diseases to animal, plant, and human hosts. Understanding and ultimately preventing these diseases needs research, and that research is funded and supported by the UK Research and in, by UK Research and Innovation and the Biotechnology and Biological Research Council. So they're the organisations that have brought us here today and put together. Um, this event and brought you some really some really brilliant speakers who are at the forefront um, of their of their topics. UKRI, UK Research and Innovation, is the UK's largest public funder of research. It brings together nine organisations with a breadth of scientific expertise, and it connects research communities, institutions, businesses, and wider society 
um, in the UK and all around the world, because as you'll see, the, the science that you're going to hear about today has impacts way beyond our national borders. The Biotechnology and Biological Research Council is one of those nine organisations that makes up UKRI. Its focus is to invest in bioscience research and training to push back the frontiers of biology and deliver a healthy, prosperous and sustainable future. So this is all about solutions and positivity, despite the fact that we're facing a, a the ticking time bomb of climate change. By helping society to meet the biggest challenges and the huge challenges, food security, green energy, how we live healthier and longer lives. But I think the best way to really showcase the research that they've supported and to delve into just how those frontiers are being pushed back is to introduce you one by one to our brilliant scientists speakers. So first of all, I would like to introduce Professor Gary Foster from the University of Bristol. Gary is Professor of Molecular Plant Pathology at the University of Bristol, and he studied microbiology before he says, seeing the light and specializing in plant virology and plant molecular biology. His research is focused on a range of interconnecting themes, including plant virology, plant pathology, plant molecular biology, molecular mycology and biotechnology. And after three cups of coffee, I can just about say all of that. His, his presentation for you today is entitled Plant Viruses Kill Plants, No Plants, No Food, No Food, Big Problem. And let me hand over our virtual stage to you, Gary. Welcome. Well, good morning or good afternoon uh, or good evening, wherever you're watching this from. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you today. And it's quite nice that the first talk you're going to get is all about uh, plant viruses, because I don't know about you, but I am fed up hearing about human viruses at the moment. But one of the amazing things is, is that people, very few people realize that plants can catch viruses too, and the effects can be just as devastating as what we've seen uh, with the current pandemic. Now, in terms of what we're facing upon this planet, there's a lovely little gift that I have that shows the increasing population across the world. And I really think it does look like humanity is almost like a plague spreading across. We really have accelerated uh, population growth right across the world uh, in recent years. And now this next slide shows a fact that is absolutely staggering, uh, in my opinion. It's basically that in the next 50 years, which is in our lifetime, um, we will need to produce as much food to feed the world's population that has ever been produced in the history of humanity. That's the last 50, added to the last 500, added to the last 5,000. That is staggering. And the fact that we have to do that with less pesticides, less fungicides, less fertilizer, less carbon input, and with the challenges of climate change, this is one massive big problem. And I'll show you uh, the significance of this as we go towards the end. What is the most important thing that um, food actually does in terms of our society? Now, where are we most likely to see this hit first? Well, in a country like Sub-Saharan Africa and Africa, not only are we going to see um, huge uh, population increases in the coming years, but we're also going to see really the first real effects of climate change hitting and hitting hard. Now, in terms of this population in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, one of the main props that is currently used to ensure food security is, of course, uh, cassava. Now, cassava is a wonderful crop, very easy to sort of plant. You take those stems, um, that you can see, and you literally chop them up uh, into sticks, you plant those sticks in the ground, and when you dig them up after a while, you get these amazing, uh, lots of people call them tubers, but they're actually swollen roots. And you can get a huge yield from these. And in terms, oh, I've lost, there we go. And in terms of what these are used for, they can be used um, to actually uh, feed your family, um, you can use these um, to any excess you have to sell at market, uh, and that money goes towards um, clothing your family or sending your children uh, to um, for education. But one of the problems is we've had a couple of waves. Um, we're all talking about waves with the pandemic at the moment, but we have waves of very serious cassava viruses that have spread across Africa. The first one that appeared um, in the 1970s, 1980s was cassava mosaic virus. And then we had a uh, second wave with cassava brown streak. Now the effects can be absolutely devastating. So at the sort of middle picture, uh, you can see the picture A 
you can see that is one amazing yield for this particular crop, which can be turned into bread, into starch, into flour, into beer, into crisps, into just about anything. Tremendous yield. But then you can see in panels B, C and D, uh, B is a very healthy plant, C a mildly infected plant, and D a, a very severely infected plant with this particular virus. And this particular virus is transmitted by white flies. It's got a vector which moves it from plant to plant. And in this case, it's white flies. And uh, we know that white flies play a tremendous part in spreading this, not only from one plant to another, one field to another, but also from one country to another. And we know this really well uh, in terms of it's linked now to climate change. We know that there is change in the geographical location of these vectors and their population levels, et cetera clearly linked. And the next wave, the viruses that came along was cassava brown streak disease. And I think this illustrates it really, really nicely in that this virus was around back in 1930 and didn't cause much problems at all in terms of damaging cassava. But all of a sudden, linked to a population uh, explosion of white flies, a um, particular type in the 1990s, this virus became, started to become a problem, a major problem. And one of the major, major problems as this spread across sub-Saharan Africa, especially in East Africa, we had no natural resistance to this. And this particular disease can cause losses up to 100%. So if you're depending on this crop to actually feed your family, uh, to actually um, sell excess at market, then you're in a downward spiral of malnutrition, starvation and poverty. Which, which is, is just really heartbreaking. We knew that there was no resistance to this. We tried to warn, um, but as a scientist, we all know it takes a little while and lots of years of warning before people listen. And Cassava Brown Street rapidly reached all the headlines. I don't know if that's a Vicky Gill. Oh no, it's Matt, <laughs> who reported on the BBC that this uh, particular virus become epidemic right across Africa. Now, what did um, various organizations do about this? Well, at last, uh, many woke up right across the world and there's a huge international effort now trying to protect not only these plants, this particular crop cassava, but many other crops from vector-borne diseases. And this is UKRI's effort. They set up a number of networks to tackle vector-borne diseases, some human, some animal. Um, and of course, we have the plant one, which is connected. And Connected is a vector-borne disease network to try and prevent these plant viruses and their vectors destroying crops right across Africa. And in a mad moment, they decided to elect me as um, director of this fantastic uh, multi-million pound program. And I have the amazing professor Neil Boonham um, from Newcastle University in the UK as my co-director who keeps me on the straight and narrow. Now, I think to explain what Connected does, I think I could probably take a rest um, with my voice and let someone else tell you a little bit about what Connected does. In much the same way insects can spread human disease, destructive plant diseases caused by plant viruses can be transmitted by white flies and other insects. They're having a devastating effect on some African countries. Take the example of cassava. It's the second most important food crop in the whole of Africa a vital source of energy and of income for the farmers and smallholders who grow it. Cassava is used to make all sorts of food products. But here's what goes wrong. Cassava brown streak virus and cassava mosaic virus destroy cassava crops. These viruses are carried by white flies, which infect the cassava plant. They spread the disease from plant to plant and from field to field. More bad news is that these devastating diseases are spreading across Africa. Losing these crops leads to malnutrition, poverty and food insecurity, hitting these countries' economic and social development. Not having enough food or income has a huge impact on families and communities. Connected is building a global network of world-class researchers developing solutions to these problems. That was an amazing uh, little animation. And we have a whole series of these that we developed with some students in Bristol who are studying 
uh, animation and film production, I think they really explain quite nicely and in simple terms, the problems that we face with these viruses that, that are vector-borne in many parts of the world. Now, as you might tell from my accent, um, I'm originally from Ireland and I'm under legal obligation that every talk I ever do, I have to mention the word potato at some point during the talk. And one of the reasons um, Ireland and indeed Scotland are famous for their potatoes is, especially seed potatoes, is it's blooming cold up there uh, in Ireland and Scotland. And aphids, which are the main vectors for plant viruses in potatoes, don't like the cold. And if you grow them, uh, seed potatoes there, it means they have a good chance of growing up virus free. Um, however, um, whilst you may not think um, that Ireland and Scotland are experiencing effects of climate change, especially during the summer, and I have good evidence of that. I'm the wind and the rain, glasses us. We're definitely in Ireland in the summer. Um, the biggest problem is not any climate change effects during our summer, but the winters are getting slightly warmer. Uh, and as that happens, the aphid populations in Scotland and Ireland, where the seed potatoes are grown, are actually um, increasing and appearing earlier. And this is going to cause a major problem for these particular countries in producing their seed potatoes. And of course, potatoes, uh, which I have to mention every other talk and every other slide, the analogy back to the Irish potato famine, where we lost a crop due to a plant disease, and we then faced mass immigration, uh, is linked today in many ways to uh, food insecurity in many parts of uh, Africa and across the world, leading to mass immigration. So during the potato famine, Irish potato famine, we had these boats, they were called the coffin ships, because many of them sank because they weren't suitable for crossing the Atlantic uh, to America. And we have very similar situations sadly today with boats not suited for the purpose, crossing the Mediterranean and crossing the English Channel. Food insecurity can drive mass immigration, but it can also drive um, a conflict. There is very good evidence that many conflicts and many revolutions and many wars have been started uh, initially by rising food prices or food insecurity. So not only are we facing a, a great challenge to actually make sure we have food security over the next 50 years, if we don't, not only will we have starvation, but it's highly likely we will have increased levels of immigration, migration, and indeed conflict. I'd like to thank you all very much for listening uh, and realizing that plants catch viruses too. And the challenges we face are absolutely dramatic in terms of not only the planet, but also humanity in terms of food security uh, and also world peace, believe it or not. I'll, I'll throw that big statement in right at the very start of this webinar. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today. Thank you, Gary. Pleasure hearing from you. That was a fascinating presentation. Um, and yeah, world peace. I mean, these issues don't get any bigger than that today. Um, I'm going to move swiftly on so we can keep things uh, moving with our brilliant presentations. Um, we're going to hear next from Dr. Bethan Purse. She's a senior scientist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, where she co-leads the Population Ecology Group. So she looks at understanding and predicting infectious disease impacts on animal, plant and human health in changing environments. She looks at socio-ecological risk factors for vector-borne zoonotic diseases that affect communities in degraded forests and co-produces decisions to support tools and guide interventions how to how to how to deal with those diseases. Her presentation is about understanding ecology, ecosystems, vulnerability and adaptation. So over to you, Bethan. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'll just share my screen. Yeah, hopefully you can all see that. So yeah, I'm going to talk to you today uh, about how uh, understanding impacts of climate change on vector borne diseases can be uh, quite complicated um, and why that is. And then I'm going to talk about um, uh, how ecosystem approaches can help us with understanding vulnerability and adaptation to vector borne diseases in changing environments. I'm going to talk about a couple of case studies. So um, we have some Indo-UK One Health uh, projects on uh, tick-borne disease called Kaisenia forest disease in degraded forests in India. 
and then I'm going to talk also about Lyme disease risks across Europe and I'll finish off by summarising some key sort of research and innovation priorities in this area. So it can be quite tricky to understand why climate change is impacting vector-borne disease systems and this is because they're very complex systems so quite often for example here for blue tongue virus in northern Europe uh, that affects sheep you have multiple uh, biting midge uh, vectors involved in transmission, multiple pathogen strains involved and multiple hosts. And climate change can have impacts on the demographic rates of these uh, species that are involved. So for example, high temperatures will increase the feeding frequency and development rates of the vectors um, and the duration of pathogen development inside the insect vectors. Um, and it, um, moisture levels will also affect the availability of aquatic and semi-aquatic breeding sites for these species. So overall, climate change is affecting the seasonal and spatial overlap of these vectors and hosts um, and impacting transmission. And also it has more minor effects on host recovery rates um, through effects on immunity and uh, resistance. But added to that, we have multiple interacting global change drivers of, of disease emergence. And this is again um, shown from midge borne diseases here. So, for example, when blue tone virus entered southern Europe and then northern Europe um, in the early 2000s, um, this was possibly linked to uh, warmer conditions being more conducive for um, transmission. But also we had uh, multiple strains entering through ruminant trade routes into Europe in both the East and West. Moreover, we had live virus vaccine strains that had been used uh, to combat the disease then being transmitted um, <clears throat> in the field. And then we also had evidence that uh, both deer and midges are involved in the natural spread um, across countries following introduction. And then in areas where uh, pathogens are, endemic pathogens are increasing in incidence due to climate, we have impacts of things like uh, extreme climate events like drought and flood that might concentrate the hosts and the midge vectors in the landscape and amplify transmission. And then for things like the human Oropouche virus, uh, we have evidence that um, vector-borne disease is sensitive to things like deforestation that can bring humans close to the natural forest cycles of these pathogens um, when they're cut down for things like the coconut and banana cult cultivation which then increased the breeding site availability for the species that transmitted on a push virus. So we have these multiple interacting drivers that we need to understand, but also it, it's becoming clear that we have multiple disease risks and climate linked stressors coinciding in vulnerable populations such as small holders and forest dependent communities. So this is why we need these ecosystem approaches to vector borne disease impacts so we can understand how environmental change is uh, acting on the ecological processes um, that affect the communities that determine hazard and also on the social processes that determine people's exposure to infected vectors um, but also on their vulnerability um, to infection and disease effects. So <clears throat> I'm going to give you an example of a project in which we've applied these kind of approaches so I'll just tell you a little bit about the disease we've been working on. So um, the disease is a tick-borne flavivirus um, that causes a disease called Chiasinure forest disease. So this is a debilitating hemorrhagic disease, uh, causes around 500 cases a year and then can cause up to 10% mortality uh, in infected individuals. Um, so KFD emerged in the 1950s when forests were cle cleared for roads and settlements and the red ring um, and the photograph show you the area in Shimoga district where um, the virus uh, first emerged. And then the, the distribution was quite stable last century, but then in the 2010s, it's, uh, the disease has spread to the neighboring states, as you can see with these gray and blue dots on the map. Um, I'm sorry, Ben, um, the, the slides aren't full screen. Could you please make oh, them full sorry. screen so everyone can see the details? Thank you. Uh, okay, sorry, I think I must be sharing the wrong screen. Uh, <clears throat> There we go, is that better? Perfect, thank you. <laughs> Great, sorry about that. <clears throat> yeah, so for KFD, disease exposure is often linked to forest use and livelihoods. And there's a wide range of um, small mammals, birds, primates, and tick species involved in transmission. And the control is through a sort of uh, fairly old vaccination with short-lived immunity. 
um, and through tick surveillance and protection measures. So, <clears throat> Seem to be okay. Sorry, I'm having trouble moving the slides on. All right, so how did we go about understanding the social and ecological processes that underpinned uh, vulnerability to KFD in these degraded forests in India? So we conducted joint social and ecological surveys, including walkthroughs and interviews in 30 sites across a forest fragmentation gradient. And this photograph shows you the kinds of landscape that we're talking about. So we have mixes of moist evergreen and dry deciduous forest. Uh, we're interrupted with things like paddy uh, cultivation and um, areca nut and other kinds of nut plantations. So first of all, thinking about the ecological processes that underpin hazard, we looked at the abundance and infection prevalence in different vectors and hosts through various trapping methodologies. And we found, for example, that tick exposure was highest in the forest, but did extend to forest edges, to houses, gardens and to paddies. So people were at risk in all these different habitat types. We also found that um, risk was wider um, than just the, the traditional vector species, Haemophysalis spinigera, and extended to other hard tick species. So then through our surveys and interviews, but also through some outbreak modelling, <clears throat> we found that spillover risk was highest where moist evergreen forest had been replaced by the plantation and paddy cultivation. Um, but we also identified seasonal livelihood activities that increased um, contact rates with ticks um, under deforestation. So these were things like uh, people traveling into the forest to collect uh, fuel for um, wood for fuel and dry leaves for fodder. And these dry leaves that are then taken back and kept inside the, kept next to the house <clears throat> where the animals are kept um, harbor ticks and stuff. So uh, causing a, a risk of tick exposure to people. And then other risky activities included grazing, grazing your uh, cattle in the forest as well. So in terms of vulnerability, <clears throat> sorry, it seems to be really difficult to move these slides on now. <clears throat> so in terms of vulnerability, um, we found that key vulnerable groups for uh, becoming infected with KFD were households that were below the poverty line or the scheduled castes and tribes. And these were people whose occupations take them into forests and crops, habitats for their work. So this included agricultural workers in plantations, but also housewives and farmers. And we found through talking with these people that they had the, a high dependence on their forest income. So, for example, when uh, decision makers banned them from entering forest, the forest during um, outbreak seasons, this caused a lot of problems for them. Um, so for these uh, vulnerable populations is important to look into income diversification, for example. We also found that the uptake of adaptive measures such as restricting your activities in forests, going for a vaccination or applying uh, tick repellents that might be traditionally made or um, commercially made, um, their uptake of these measures depended on the access to health extension services and their levels of information about KFD which tended to be quite low, particularly in some of the areas that were uh, more remote from cities and towns. So how did we use this information then in trying to foster adaptation to this vector-borne disease impact under deforestation? <clears throat> so we integrated these risk maps that we've developed through the outbreak modeling into decision support tools that we co-produced with multi-sectoral stakeholders across the human, animal and environment sectors. So these are sort of integrative models that integrate data and driver and knowledge of risk factors across the sectors to enhance preparedness. Um, so you can see, for example, the map shows these high risk areas in red and then the decision makers can superimpose upon them the human cases um, and then the tick and monkey surveillance results and they can also look at landscape features that traditionally govern their management like roads um, and village centres. So the hope is that these risk maps will improve targeting of surveillance and vaccination and awareness raising. So this co-production across uh, sectors is really important to ensure that we're tailoring these risk maps and decision support tools to the needs of end users. And we also building on our knowledge of their adaptation measures and levels of knowledge about the vector borne disease system we also tailored risk guidance for health workers and communities. And you can see here these sort of handheld tick cards that um, 
provide information about the risks from ticks and how to prevent uh, tick bites. And we provide these in multiple languages. And overall, we're trying to build awareness among decision makers of the key vulnerable groups and their needs for resources and how this trades off with their exposure risk. Um, and also how, how, how their access to healthcare and information um, affects their um, adaptation measures. So these sort of integrated systems approaches can also be applied at more continental scales or national scales to assess future vector-borne disease threats when climate and land use changes are interacting. So this is an example of a study by uh, Lee and others um, on the and certain uh, drivers of Lyme disease risk across Europe. So uh, these models projected the land use changes across Europe linked to socioeconomic scenarios that again were co-developed with po policy makers across sectors. And you can see from the diagram on the left hand side that the model captured the climate and land use changes on the tick and host populations um, and how these cascaded through into transmission so what this study found, for example, shown in the maps on the right, is that um, future temperature increases that we are going to see might not always amplify Lyme disease risk. So, for example, in low emission scenarios, um, this was not found to be the case. Overall, they found that climate warming would expand the risks in northern Europe, but the conversion of forest to agriculture might limit uh, risk in southern Europe. So just, this just illustrates how um, it can be quite com complex predicting impacts of climate change uh, and land use change on um, vector-borne disease systems, and we really need these integrated systems approaches. So here are some key research and innovation priorities that arise from this um, that will help us to uh, adapt to vector-borne disease impacts under environmental change. Um, so we really need to stre strengthen vector and pathogen surveillance and um, incrimination studies of which vectors and hosts are involved in transmission, particularly in resource poor settings that in which surveillance has traditionally been uh, weaker, but also in the source regions that are connected to us by trade and travel. And we really need to consider the whole uh, vector and, and host community that are interacting in ecosystem interfaces. We need to take these ecosystem approaches where we study and model vector um, and host pathogen dynamics over time through longitudinal studies to try and detect these climate impacts, but also over environmental change gradients as well um, over space. Um, we need to understand how exposure links to human use of e ecosystems and uh, cross-sectoral policies and understand the trade-offs with the land use changes that are likely to come from climate change mitigation, such as forest expansion. Uh, we need to co-produce risk models and early warning systems with decision makers that integrate drivers, data and knowledge across sectors. And we need to work with communities to understand drivers of vulnerability, accounting for the fact that they're coping with multiple disease risks and stresses from climate change and co-create adaptation strategies with them. Overall, we need interfaces that enable us to better link climate and health policy, uh, working groups and information systems so that we can minimise these climate link vector borne disease impacts. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Um, I just want to also acknowledge um, the Monkey Fever Risk team as well and the funding from UKRI um, and the communities and stakeholders that we've that have valued, that have contributed their valuable time and knowledge to our research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Beth. That was that was fascinating. I don't think I've actually thought about the the impact on health of climate change mitigation measures and that changing our environment. Um, I'll move swiftly on to our next excellent presenter, Professor Rachel Lowe from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, her research, she actually leads a, a group of researchers who um, who from the, the combined mathematical modeling and infectious disease um, combination between looking at climate change and planetary health. So I'll hand over the virtual stage to Rachel. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Victoria. Can you hear me okay? I can, so I'm assuming everyone else can. Okay, brilliant. Um, so I'll make a start. Thank you very much for the opportunity um, to present on this Climate Change Bites webinar. Um, so I'm going to uh, speak to you a bit about some of the work we've been doing trying to understand the links between climate change and vector-borne diseases. 
Now, some of you may have seen this visualization um, known as the warming stripes, which very um, is a stark uh, visualization of how much the climate, the global climate has been warming um, over the last few decades. And then we can see to the right of this graph, uh, the projected uh, temperature increases depending on the decisions that are made at uh, COP26. So uh, whether we continue as business as usual and move into a very uh, dark uh, situation, or we take action to really limit um, the level of warming. And of course, this is going to have very important implications for many health impacts, including the distribution of uh, vector-borne diseases. So the dramatic warming we've already seen over the last few decades has been accompanied by a uh, increase in the global distribution of dengue, which is a mosquito-borne viral disease. In the 1970s, there were around nine countries reporting epidemics of this disease, and that number has now increased to over 120 and is uh, set to increase. Uh, in a recent study, uh, we projected how the length of the transmission season and the population at risk uh, would change for two of the most important vector-borne diseases, dengue and malaria. And we found that in a scenario of business as usual, allowing global temperatures to warm above 3.7 degrees C, then an additional 4.7 billion people would be at risk of these diseases, particularly in um, urban areas. Whereas if we were to take action and limit that warming uh, below one degree, then we could uh, reduce the additional number of people at risk to around half that amount. Of course, it is not just climate change that is uh, impacting um, the risk of vector-borne diseases. It's very much linked to things like population growth, unplanned urbanization, and inadequate infrastructure. This graph here shows us a, um, this is one of the largest favelas in Rio de Janeiro. And we can see, uh, you can see the blue uh, spots on the, on the image are temporary water storage containers that are often uh, relied upon, uh, particularly during water shortages. Um, and these provide ideal mosquito breeding sites. So this combined with uh, extreme weather events um, and these poor sanitation conditions uh, and lots of people packed very closely together can provide the ideal conditions for uh, dramatic outbreaks. And of course, due to globalization, international travel and trade, combined with warming temperatures and an extreme um, events, we're seeing not just um, areas which would uh, classically uh, endemic for these diseases at risk, but also um, places such as Europe have seen recent um, outbreaks of diseases like dengue and chikungunya. So this is something we really need to be uh, ready for. So our team are working to try and understand how we can use uh, global observations, so Earth observations, to understand uh, changes in uh, meteorological conditions and land use changes, and to combine this with disease surveillance data um, to co-create uh, decision support systems with our stakeholders um, to try and uh, provide climate services to help strengthen climate resilience uh, to outbreaks of these diseases. So one example of the work, some work we've been doing um, to understand the changing risk of arborises in the Caribbean, uh, working with our partners in Barbados, uh, it was noted that the epidemiology of dengue has been changing lately, and uh, that was uh, had been potentially linked to uh, the severe droughts that have been experienced on the island. It's one of the most water strained uh, countries in the world. And we conducted a, um, a modeling study to try and understand the links between extreme hydrometeorological events and dengue outbreaks. And we found this interesting pattern that several months after a drought, we saw an increased risk of, um, of dengue, um, but also another um, increased risk immediately following exceptionally wet conditions. And, and this kind of information uh, combined um, with the uh, meteorological services um, data can be used to um, predict the outbreaks of, um, uh, of dengue in the island uh, several months in advance. So by understanding if we are seeing hot and dry conditions uh, followed by particularly wet conditions, then according to our modeling work, this provides the, um, the optimum climate conditions for an outbreak. And, and this kind of climatic um, situation um, has been uh, 
considered and used uh, to inform policymakers in the Caribbean Health Climatic Bulletin. So when there is this pattern where we're seeing uh, drought events, which can lead to um, additional water storage, uh, which could then lead to um, an unintended consequence of having um, additional breeding sites, this combined with a particularly warm and wet season uh, several months later, um, should um, raise an alarm to be particularly prepared for a potential outbreak of dengue. So um, our group has been working very closely uh, with partners in Brazil for, for several years now. This is an example of a, a study we conducted to provide a dengue outlook across the country ahead of the 2014 World Cup. So in this, um, in this piece of work, we combined seasonal climate forecasts with the latest uh, surveillance uh, data available at the time of the forecast to produce these probabilistic forecasts of exceeding epidemic levels um, across the country. Um, this, this kind of modeling approach considers how uh, the seasonality of um, dengue and, and the vectors can vary according to different bi biomes. So if you're in the Amazon rainforest or the south, um, the south um, Atlantic rainforest will see different uh, timings of the peak and then we can use our model to predict deviations from this seasonality. And we extended the modeling uh, work we conducted in Barbados where we found a link between drought and dengue. And we, uh, we modeled this across the whole of Brazil. So it's a very large geographical domain um, with a very um, diverse um, urban landscape. And we found that this drought effect uh, was also present in Brazil and it was particularly exacerbated in urban areas where there was um, uh, water shortages experienced during drought events. So this kind of information helps decision makers know which climate indicators they should monitor to be ready for um, seasonal outbreaks of the disease and also be ready to prepare for increased uh, uh, hydrometeorological extremes going forward. Um, this afternoon, if you can, uh, if you're up for another webinar, we are launching the 2021 Lancet Countdown Report, uh, where you can hear from experts um, about the, the latest findings tracking uh, progress on health and climate change across the globe. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Rachel. Um, and yeah, if anyone's up for another webinar, I think there's just every single time one of these pres presenters speaks, it just, just brings it home to me how interconnected all of these problems are. You know, we're facing looking down the barrel of COP26, but actually this is all about planetary health, our own health. Um, it all ties together in this in this complicated system. Um, so to, on to our next presenter, who is Dr. Raman Balayudan from the World Health Organization. He has a job title that would not fit on a TV screen, but uh, he is, amongst many other things, the global focal point for dengue prevention and control. And his presentation is themed on the global threat of vector-borne diseases in a changing environment. Um, so Raman, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Victoria. And I also would like to thank the previous speaker, Dr. Rachel, because she has, it's a, the, the talk really flows from one to the other. This is really uh, perfect. So my talk is basically focused on the threat of vector bond diseases in a changing environment. And as you have seen, I work in the Department of Control of uh, Neglected Tropical Diseases, where we have actually eight vector bond diseases. And you can see them here we have the Chagas, the Leishmaniasis, uh, human African trypnosomiasis, dengue and chikungunya. And then of course, uh, in this section, we have um, lymphatic filariasis, schistosomiasis and onchocerciasis. So all these are vector bound disease, but the biggest uh, burden is actually the dengue virus. So the previous speakers have clearly highlighted what it takes for the vector to get established and why these many uh, problems are caused by vectors. And the point as I really want to highlight is the temperature really influences the lifespan, the reproduction and feeding potential of the vector. So the, as a, the warmer temperature definitely favors their multiplication and also the multiplication of the pathogen within the body. The rainfall is definitely a, a, a contributing factor, but at the same time, drought is also equally contributing. But what has happened is vectors have also moved and we are silent spectators. And in fact, 
uh, unknowingly, we call them invasive species, but they have moved year, many, many years ago. So they have moved up in altitude as well as in latitude, the distribution of vectors have significantly shifted. And there is of course the animal host, which uh, they, are, they can choose and they do adapt to new environment. So this is the unique nature of uh, vector, these vector bond disease, especially uh, dengue. So just to recap, you might have heard in the media during the last decade, Japan had an outbreak of dengue after a gap of 70 years in 2014, right in their capital, Tokyo. Madeira Island in Portugal had a dengue outbreak in 2012, which was really large. Dengue outbreak was reported in Afghanistan for the first time in 2019, which again shows the movement of the vector and the parasite or the virus to this new area. There is a new urban vector in the, in the Horn of Africa, causing outbreak, which, which, was, which caused an outbreak in Djibouti. And this is again an interesting story because here is, a, is a, as we control malaria in Africa, we are seeing a new invasive species which has come from Asia and thriving in urban areas, and in fact, coexisting with Aedes mosquitoes. So these are some of the other alerts. There is, over, as you may, we are in the midst of a pandemic, but please remember that these diseases, especially dengue and arboviral diseases are still on the rampage. There is over a million cases of dengue reported worldwide so far. In fact, 1.2 million right now. There is possible emergence of Zika in Brazil and in India, in Kerala. Then there is, of course, uh, outbreak of chikungunya in parts of Africa, and uh, the drought situation is also triggering uh, outbreaks in, in several parts of the world, including Brazil. Now, one important factor I want to highlight is, please remember that two mosquitoes, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, are passing these diseases. In fact, four diseases, top diseases, dengue, chikungunya, Zika and yellow fever. So we are dealing with just two species, while in the case of malaria, for example, you have multiple species of Anopheles, which transmits malaria. But here we are dealing with just two, and we are still struggling to have any control of them. We recently mapped these countries where these three diseases are common. You can see the darker it comes, all the three diseases are there, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika. So this disease, actually the number of countries affected by dengue today is over 129. Now you also may know, and it may surprise you to know that Aedes mosquitoes have invaded parts of Europe. And in fact, 22 countries of Europe, Aedes albopictus is very well established. And there is always a potential for periodic outbreaks of any of these disease, arboviral disease in parts of Europe. And this is a map just taken from ECDC which clearly shows the current prevalence of Aedes mosquitoes in several European countries. Overall, Lancet had clearly stated recently that dengue is the single communicable disease which has grown sixfold since 2000. And this graph clearly highlights the growing problem of dengue. And I will tell you why it is the, the case because we are linked very closely with some of the factors which the previous speakers have already touched on. Another slide, just to tell you the success story with malaria, with a huge investment, malaria has significantly declined and the number of countries with malaria have gone down from over 108 and it is still declining. The population at risk is about 3.2 million, but on the other hand, dengue has increased. The number of countries, as Rachel had said earlier, from about nine countries before 1970, today we have over 129 countries reporting dengue. And it, in fact, the number grows on. The infection wise also, dengue is actually higher than malaria. It is only the death rate where dengue is less than malaria. And thankfully to our doctors, we are keeping the deaths rather manageable, but we still hope that this can be controlled further. Now, in terms of climate change, basically we, the basic facts are temperature, rainfall, and humidity certainly favors vector development. It also helps in increasing vector biting frequency and faster amplification of the virus. Higher temperature, when I talk of higher temperature, anything about 35 is not very favorable to the vector, but those temperatures are very, the pockets are few and seasonal. 
But on the other hand, uh, majority of the areas, the temperature is well below 35. So rainfall uh, definitely favors more breeding sites, water storage during drought increases breeding sites and virus multiplication is a, is a known factor. So climate change favors the vector and we have several publications for this. Um, the water supply can be erratic, especially in urban areas, which leads to more water storage. Uh, increased temperature also favors them. And uh, there is El Nino phenomenon in the Pacific, which can clearly be correlated with potential dengue outbreaks. Touching on One Health, many diseases were covered by earlier speakers, but just I want to point out two diseases. For example, leishmaniasis is one disease which affects over nearly 12 million people are infected and uh, around 350 million are at risk, but still we do not have the answer to control uh, cutaneous leishmaniasis and even visceral leishmaniasis because of the intermediate host, our animals. And we really need to get to work on under One Health and tackle this growing problem of leishmaniasis, which is prevalent in many, many countries of the world. Second is Lyme disease, which was already covered, but just to give you an estimate, about 300,000 people are likely to be diagnosed and treated for Lyme disease in United States alone, but it is also occurring in Europe. So this is another area where ticks are the main uh, vector, and we really need to think about them because ticks are very sturdy creatures and there are growing evidence of more spread of ticks uh, all over towards the Northern uh, countries. Now, one part I really want to highlight on is urban uh, centers because as the world population increases, they are also getting more urbanized. It is estimated that around 70% of the world would be urbanized by 2030. Now, what does this mean? It brings people together. There's a change in land use and land cover. Movement of people and goods are much rapid. There are administrative challenges because essentially health is devolved and we need to uh, deal with local councils and they need to be equipped. Health system delivery in urban center is a challenge because you can deliver uh, services in a village by mobilizing them on a particular day getting the chief on board, but there's no chief in an urban area and health system delivery in an urban center is definitely a challenge. And we, this is a topic which we are trying to grapple with. Migrating population. There is a huge number of migration within urban centers for jobs and also because of restrictions imposed by the governments. Urbanization affects definitely the demand for water supply. And the last point I really want to touch here is on water stress. Please remember that in South Africa, there was a period about three years ago where a city was almost shot completely dry or without a drop of water. And this photograph on the right hand side is actually a true picture taken from an Indian state of Tamil Nadu, which is of course one of my bases where water had to be brought by trains. There was no water in the whole city of 10, nearly 12 million people. So this map really shows that by 2040, a good percentage of the world would have water crisis. We really need to plan this properly, save water. And this is a huge issue, just like food, water can be another area of dispute because this is going to be in short supply. We have a global vector control response adopted soon after the Zika crisis. As we are in the midst of a pandemic, it is good to remember that the previous uh, pub, uh, disease of public health emergency was Zika. And Zika just started in 2016 as a big problem. It is still there lingering in many countries. And this uh, global vector control response was at the request of member countries that we developed this to really tar target vector control at the local level. So we really have four technical elements here, intersectoral collaboration, community mobilization, enhancing vector surveillance, monitoring and evaluation, scaling up vector control tools. And of course, this has to be based on good capacity and uh, uh, by promoting basic and applied research. The enabling factors, of course, you know, is strong country leadership, advocacy, resource mobilization and partnership and regulatory and policy support. 
the new, the good point we have today is for AIDS bond diseases, there are tools in the pipeline. And some of them which are currently under review within WHO's advisory group, vector control advisory group are spatial repellents. There are several traps which can control AIDS, sterile insect technique, which is also promoted by the International Atomic Energy Agency. And then we have Volbachia, which many of you would have read in the media, Volbachia trial in uh, Indonesia has so shown that dengue transmission can be reduced by over 70% and it has proven to have public health value. Aedes control is also linked to several SDGs in terms of poverty, good health, clean water, sustainable cities, climate action, and partnerships. So here we are working with other agencies as well to link it with the UN goals of uh, sustainable development. Uh, so the way forward basically is we really need a very strong integrated surveillance and surveillance should be the key because we really don't know where what is in our backyard in terms of vectors there may be new vectors we need data based decision and post covid this gives an opportunity for us to implement better diagnostics and better surveillance we need uh, a multi-sectoral health care with the both, both uh, for prevention as well as care. And this should involve both private public partnership. We need coordination, leadership, financial support because the, at the country level, uh, the resources has to be sustained. And this is a key to many areas where AIDS has ever been reduced. Uh, shared resources, we need to share resources with other ministries and other departments within a urban city. Preventive services has to be also result-based we need uh, community support with media to play an active role. And of course, supporting research and development of all innovative tools uh, is a key to overcome the challenge posed by climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Raman, so interesting. And we know when we start to talk about things like the importance of clean water, I think it, it really brings it home um, just you know how fundamental issues like that have not been solved in many parts of the world you know while we're talking about we were so fixated on on covid and the the issues that that presents to our very sort of western view um now i'm going to introduce uh, move on and introduce our final speaker before we move on to our panel discussion dr tiana brand is foresight advisor at the world organization for animal health um, we'll be hearing about this all-important One Health approach to address health risks, um, and her presentation is titled The Latest Buzz on Vector-Borne Diseases in Animals. Welcome, Tiana. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, uh, just one moment, I'll just share my screen in one second here. Everybody can see that? I hope. Yes. Yep, I can see that. Perfect. Yeah. Thank oh, you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Happy to be here and be a part of the panel of speakers. Uh, I'm not a researcher. I don't work for a research organization. But in any event, I hope to give you um, a little bit of information about what we are seeing, what our member countries are um, feeding back to us in terms of their own surveillance on two uh, vector-borne diseases, West Nile fever and uh, blue tongue disease. Um, moving on, so if you hadn't heard about the World Organization for Animal Health, um, currently known as the OIE, I'll give you a little bit of background information. So the first fun fact about us is um, the founding of this organization precedes that of the United Nations. We were established in 1924. The second fun fact about us is that we're not part of the UN family of organizations um, and programs, but we do partner with WHO, FAO, and UNEP. Overall, our main um, mandate, we bring together 182 members with a, a mandate to improve animal health and welfare throughout the world. We are at our core, a standard setting organization that has, um, it is recognized by the World Trade Organization on matters of animal health, 
We are there to help guarantee health safety, or the standards are anyways, health safety of international trade in animals and their products. So we've worked over um, for almost 100 years. We've tried to increase transparency with um, the status of diseases in the country with our members. And um, to give a, a global picture of what the disease, animal disease situation is like, that also includes diseases that are transmissible, transmissible to humans. And our whole idea is also to prevent, um, uh, sorry, to publish prevention and control methods for, for these diseases. So our, our other main driver behind all this is to accompany veterinary services and facilitate information sharing amongst experts. And we act thanks to the commitment of the staff working at our headquarters, as well as our 13 regional and sub-regional representation. Um, this slide just shows a little bit of what we're like in, in the numbers. So given that our mandate is to improve animal health and welfare throughout the world, we often look at health through a variety of perspectives. So if animal health and welfare could be illustrated in a mathematical formula, diseases, um, pathogens, production inputs um, would be more or less the, the variables. Sorry, I pulled them up. I forgot I had animation as I go along. They would be the variables um, uh, and constants in, in our mathematical form formula. Factors um, such as human growth population, production conditions in animal production systems, globalization, and um, species interactions, which all the speakers have spoken about today, these would, um, these would have a multiplier effect. And in terms of climate change, it interacts with all of these. And whether it's a multiplier or square root or an exponent um, within this formula, it certainly adds complexity to the risk management efforts for positive um, health and welfare outcomes. All right. So some of these factors um, are also amongst many that occur in the spread of animal diseases. As I mentioned before, these all interact with one another, but you also have to think about the ripple effects, which have also been touched on by the speakers as well. The ripple effects that disease spread in the context of climate change is having and, and will have. Just as a visual um, example of those ripple effects, climate change, uh, we are looking at um, IPP, IPCC assessment reports. And they give some striking examples. I'm, I'm just using the one from the fifth assessment report from the working group on impacts, uh, adaptations and vulnerabilities because the sixth um, assessment reports not quite ready or the working group's information is not quite ready until later on um, in early 2022. So given that we're concerned about the health of animals, there are a number of points that stand out for us. Certainly food security under nutrition. So that could be um, animals as, um, as food or but also the food coming to the animals. Um, food and waterborne infections and vector-borne diseases and which I had mentioned earlier I will touch on a West Nile fever and, and blue tongue. So just some facts. <laughs> well what started out as your, um, I say this with my tongue firmly planted in my cheek, your run-of-the-mill uh, vector-borne diseases that um, spread as a result of introducing, in some cases, susceptible, susceptible species into environments where the virus was circulating well, since the beginning of time, so such as blue tongue. Some of them have been spread through trade. Um, we are now seeing vector-borne diseases being referred to as climate-sensitive diseases as the climatic conditions for the vectors, um, the insects through which the viruses cycle become more and more favorable for propagation. So just to give you an idea, uh, West Nile fever was known to us um, or first isolated in, in the 1930s. There was um, the realization of the role of mosquitoes in the viral transmission. And then we started seeing things pop up in the early 90s, uh, sorry, late 90s, where um, 
the virus was spread to North America um, as possibly as a result of an infected bird. For, for blue tongue, the, the biting midges have been around forever. The virus has probably been around forever. We didn't really start seeing it um, manifest until there was some sheep farming in South Africa. So bringing European be, uh, breeds over to um, an area that these, <laughs> these sheep had never, <laughs> had never been in before and had never been exposed to this virus before. Um, we, the late 1990s, there was an explosion um, of uh, blue tongue in the Mediterranean, across the Mediterranean, and now it's everywhere, everywhere except for Antarctica. And where the climate um, will allow for biting midges uh, to survive the winter, the virus will be, will be present. So this is just to in illustrate the current status of outbreaks of West Nile fever um, for the period of 2019 to 1 October 2021. So you'll see that um, there are 205 outbreaks um, current, <laughs> occurring. They might have been uh, closed by now. It depends on what members, um, what they're doing in terms of their disease control measures and their surveillance as well. Of course, this slide would be much more impactful if it was showing more of an animated um, process uh, like over the past 10 years or so. But I think the static picture also uh, tells a lot. And as um, West Nile fever is referred to as a listed disease by the OIE, there is an expectation for members to um, report on the occurrence of outbreaks or the presence of the disease or pathogen. All this data that I'm presenting to you today is publicly available through our World Animal Health Information System. And it's thanks to our members' commitment to transparency regarding the status of animal diseases that we receive this, this data. So again, um, I just want to talk about, pardon me, immediate notifications that we receive from our member countries. And immediate notifications usually refers to having to report within the first 24 hours of your detection um, of, um, of the disease or the pathogen. First occurrence is usually, um, sorry, the immediate notifications result as a first occurrence of the disease or the re reoccurrence of the disease. Um, the first occurrence of a new pathogen, pathogenic um, strain or agent or the reoccurrence of an eradicated strain or agent. Um, or the sudden unexpected uh, change in distribution or increase in incidence of, um, of the pathogen. So in this period, we were seeing seven members that reported uh, West Nile fever through immediate notifications. Some of the members were reporting in the sense of um, not only just at their country level, but now they're starting to get down to the, the details and geographically where they are finding the, the pathogen in, so that's what I mean by a zone. So a zone is usually a geographic geographic area. So a first con, uh, occurrence in a particular zone in Brazil and then in Germany and reoccurrences have um, taken place or been reported by Austria, Brazil, Bulgaria, France, Germany, Greece, and, and Portugal. Just to give you a bit of a background, I looked at the data from 2018 to March 2019, and the 11 countries reported first occurrence. So Germany, um, Slovenia, Brazil, Romania, and Bulgaria. You can see that um, now we're looking also at Germany, but they're going down to um, a reoccurrent level and also into a zone <laughs> zone level. So a lot of those times this data gets, a, it gets um, there's a lot to analyze and a lot to, to, um, to digest when we, when we get this information. For blue tongue, well, blue tongue, it seems to be um, a never ending story where we find all kinds of uh, serotypes. And if we could zoom in on these outbreaks, you will see that there are the outbreaks in wildlife and domestic um, and domestic animals. And this map is really just showing what is happening in Europe. We didn't even look at the rest of the world at this point. Already 1,000, um, uh, 1,081 outbreaks involving many different serotypes is, is already quite a lot of information, I think. 
Um, then getting down to the immediate notifications, as I mentioned before, why we have these immediate notifications is because there's something happening in the environment with this, um, with this disease, with this pathogen that is um, in driving members to report um, what, what is happening. So 18 countries uh, reported blue tongue through immediate notifications. The first uh, occurrence in a zone or a country was reported by Bulgaria. And then there's a series of reoccurrence um, immediate notifications come from other countries. As you can see, we have a new serotype as of June 20, uh, in a new serotype in Mayotte as of June 2021. So it's just going around and around and around. Again, looking at the data from a little bit from last year, um, eight countries reported two new sero um, new serotype two in Italy and Turkey, and six, country six countries for the first time uh, reported uh, blue tongue. So Kenya, Egypt, Cyprus, Portugal, Tunisia, and, and Germany. The challenge. Well, I think we've heard um, many times during this panel discussion that it creates climate change creates risks for humans, animals, uh, animal health and food security. I'm sorry, I didn't mention plants as well. I should have put that in there right away. Um, and health services strengthening from our perspective anyways, from the OIU's perspective is a key enabler or risk mitigation. So where do we reduce the impact? Looking back at that equation, um, you know, we, we, there's, there's so many, um, or climate change really does have many adaptive challenges, especially for, you know, from our, whom we're supporting from veterinary services. There, there's such climb, uh, complex and dynamic international um, epidemiological situations that require ongoing research and surveillance. There is some predictive capacity uh, such that you can take the data that you're seeing today and overlay that with weather data and, and what we've already seen in, from the other speakers. But there is so much uncertainty and variability that affects our understanding of specific risks and likely scenarios. So veterinary services, for example, need the support and encouragement and training to fully understand their role in addressing threats and opportunities. This requires ongoing commitments to development support, collaboration, regulatory convergence, harmonization with international standards, the list goes on. Uh, what we try to do um, from an OAE perspective is with our standards, at least try to um, lower the risk is somewhere in this, in this equation um, by, offering, um, by offering up our, our international standards. So that means, we are running to, to try to keep up with our understanding of health risks and the solutions in the context of climate change amongst all the other factors and, and variables. And with that, I would like to thank everybody for listening. And I'd also like to acknowledge the, the help that I received, a big shout out to our OIE WAHIS team who helped me pull this data together. Thanks. For Thank you very much, Tiana. Um, that was great. And thank you to all of our speakers. Um, you've, it's been so illuminating. There's, there's so much information to take in. So I hope it's, um, it's really triggered some, some questions that you can put to our panel. Um, the panel will be um, large and incredibly expert um, because we'll be joined by all of our speakers, but I'm also gonna be uh, joined by four other panelists. Um, so if you, if all of you panelists could please pop your cameras on so we can see you. You can leave yourselves uh, muted if you'd like um, until you want to chime in on a question. Um, there's many of you, so we're gonna try and get around with some of the questions that have been submitted previously and also that have been submitted on the Q&A. But I first wanted to go to each of our new panelists, um, Professor Luke Alfie, Professor Matthew Bayliss, Professor Ian Tote, and Professor Lauren Cator, who we, you won't have heard of in the presentations, everyone who's listening, um, but will be joining us for this discussion. So I'd like to go to each one of our new panelists that you haven't heard from in turn and just ask them to introduce themselves um, and tell us very briefly um, what their particular area of specialism is. And I've also got a brilliant question that was um, submitted by one of the UKRI team 
uh, which is if you were director general of the UN, what's the first thing you do? Um, so I'd like to put that to our new panelists, if that's okay. So um, just in order, in, in sort of no particular order, just the order that you were you were all listed to me. Can I just ask Luke, first of all, um, could you just introduce yourself and uh, give yourself the job of uh, UN director general? Uh, I'm, I'm Luke Alfie. I'm at the Perbright Institute, which is a, a UKRI BBSRC supported livestock virology institute. I work on uh, control of insects, particularly mosquitoes, by genetic methods, so uh, engineered insects of, of one sort or another. And I have no ambition to be director of the United Nations. <laughs> That's an excellent get out. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Luke. Um, so uh, if I can just go to uh, Professor Matthew Bayless next, uh, next, in, next in line to take on that challenge. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Professor Matthew Bayliss at the University of Liverpool. I've been working on vector-borne diseases for, um, uh, for about 30 years or so, uh, working on tsetse flies in Africa and then biting midge. Uh, diseases in Europe, and then uh, also now a number of other vector-borne diseases, including uh, those transmitted by mosquitoes. Uh, and I work in particular on the impacts of climate and climate change on the risk of those diseases. Uh, if I was the Director General of the United Nations, I would immediately go out and buy a really nice electric car, partly because I need a new car, and I'd now have the money to afford one, but also it would be doing my bit uh, to, uh, to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. And um, Ian Tote, can I ask you next to introduce yourself? Hi, my name's Ian Tote. I'm a plant pathologist. I'm also the director of Scotland's Plant Health Centre, and I work at the James Sutton Institute in Scotland in Dundee. If I was the director general, I would get a good night's sleep because I think <laughs> I need it. <laughs> Good answer. These are very practical answers um, for people who work in very in very practical realms of research. Um, Lauren Cato, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Good morning. I'm Lauren Cater. I'm a senior lecturer at Imperial College, and I'm a medical entomologist. I study the behavior of many of the mosquitoes that were referred to this morning. Oh gosh, uh, Director General. Um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna follow Luke's lead and say that's not a job I'd like to fill, but I'm I'm glad someone is. <laughs> that's entirely reasonable. Um, so I'll just ask you all to to chime in if um, if you hear me direct a question that really is at your street expertise wise. Um, but I want to start first of all. Um, we had a question and I, I wanted to get to, to some of them on the Q and A. Um, just to say very briefly that we've we've run a tiny little bit over, but I actually really want to thank the presenters for for sticking pretty much to time because it is particularly difficult by Zoom when you've got those kind of clunky transitions as well. Um, and we've still got um, well over 45 minutes um, to, to talk. So um, I wanted to put a question from the, from the Q&A uh, first of all. So um, William Wint was actually one of the first people to put a question on the, on the Q&A and he just asks whether we should really be start or he asks, he almost demands, can we please start thinking about environmental change rather than just climate change? Um, so I, I wanted to ask any of you who would be willing to chime in on that. Do we think enough about just how interconnected all of the ways in which humans change the environment, including climate change, um, are, are bringing into play the, the changes in our planetary health? We've got, we've got Matthew, do you, do you like to start on that? And Ian, I'll come to you next. I'm happy to jump in. I think actually as scientists, uh, we are very aware of the importance of talking about environmental change rather than just climate change. Uh, clearly, and as, the, as many of the presentations are made very clear this morning, uh, you know, vector-borne diseases are affected by a whole host of different factors. And we as scientists need to take all of those into account. But equally, for the policymakers out there, we need very clear messages and in areas where where they can actually do something and so i think for an event like this based around uh, built on cop 26 you know we need to be able to say to the policymakers, here's one thing you can do uh, address climate change that will that will help with vector-borne diseases although there'll be other things that need to happen too and ian what, what about you I, I was just going to say that i saw williams uh, question i desperately tried to answer it i think something went wrong technically for me but but 
just to say it's a really important area and particularly changing landscapes for plant health. Um, things like planting trees, if you're going to start planting millions of trees to mitigate climate change, it's going to have a huge effect on the vectors for animal and plant health, but also for the different types of pests and diseases and also bridging between landscapes if you have new crops and things, etc. So hugely important and uh, certainly we would never forget about that area. Yeah. Um, and it is a question actually that was submitted in advance and, and it's something that, um, that I'm particularly interested in. I think it's one for Lauren and possibly Luke. Um, as well as the changes in the ranges and habitat that are um, impacted by climate change, do you think new species of, of insects, particularly mosquitoes, will evolve as global temperatures rise um, and as the, as the landscape changes as well? Is that one for you, Lauren? I can start. Uh, I guess I, I really am less concerned about new species evolving and really more concerned about the current species. Um, and that's because, as, as you've just explained, there's potentially some changes in the distributions of those species, um, but also in their capacity for transmitting diseases. So you've got a vector that's very sensitive to temperature, but you also have pathogens that are sensitive to temperature. And so when you've got these uh, mixing, you can have very unpredictable things happening. Um, I would say in the longer term, there's also potential for these existing species to adapt those thermal ranges. So not just how far they can go because the temperature is changing, but they themselves may adapt. So I think it's really a question of the species we have right now, not, not new species developing. Um, and Luke, do you, do you have anything to add on, on that about sort of um, new or uh, changes um, in species? I guess we, maybe as a, um, as a society, we've become a little bit obsessed with looking for the tiniest mutations in one particular um, virus over the, the last 18 months. But also, how, clim how does climate change in particular change the relationship between an insect like a mosquito and the disease causing pathogen um, that it's, it, it carries around? Yeah, I think, I think on the species question, I, I'm less concerned about new species. I mean, just fundamentally, we think of you know, the just different, different timescales primarily that, you know, climate change is happening on a timescale of decades and, and a century or two. And, and you know, if evolution of new species we think of as typically happening on considerably longer timescales than that. But adaptation happen very quickly. These are quite short generation, quite fast breeding species. And, that, you know, we know we have seen insecticide resistance, for example, drive through species on, on you know, timescales of, of years and decades, and we would expect adaptation to things like temperature and, and so on also to happen quite rapidly. So, they, so rather than new species emerging, changing properties of existing species, I think would, would be more likely and more, uh, and more problematic. Mm. And, and in terms of the, I think you asked about the relationship between uh, climate change and um, Vectors and so on. As Lauren uh, alluded to, uh, you know, temperature in particular has a big effect. So not only can the mosquitoes breed, you know, the, these are not warm-blooded creatures, so they're really, really affected by temperature a lot. And uh, their whole behavior changes. A lot of things happen faster at warmer temperatures, not only for the mosquito, but also for the for the pathogen, which is, you know, in, in its stage when it's inside the uh, the vector. So, so yes, things can happen qu quite a lot faster. And that is, you know, on the whole bad until you get to the top end of their viable range. But these tropical mosquitoes, that's, as I think Raman uh, mentioned, sort of 35 degrees plus, which is, uh, you know, would have all sorts of problems for humans all of its own before we get into uh, vector-borne disease. So, so yeah, big pro um, that's going to change. And it's going to change quite unpredictably from one place to another. And also humidity and rainfall um, precipitation, extremely important. And, you know, rather harder to predict uh, how that's going to change, and that'll sort of move things around. And then moving moving things around, even if even if all you had was redistribution, you're taking these vectors and diseases from places that are familiar with them to places that are not familiar with them, which would be hugely problematic on its own, even if it was only the sort of same total number of people affected. Yeah, and and we heard um, we heard a lot from numerous speakers actually, you know, about the socioeconomic factors that that play into this. Um, the, the increased risk that um, are barriers to, to education and information and 
Um, and one and Dan Vink on the Q and A asked about how we uh, how we ensure that there's a, an, a more equitable input, I guess, into research and, and the benefits of research as well. I mean, a lot of you, you know, you cross borders all around the world in terms of the output of what you do. And um, I wondered who would just want to talk about that in ensuring that there's kind of an equitable share, just in terms of the focus of the research as well as who benefits from the research and innovation. Got a hand up from Beth. You got in there first, and Gary. So if I go to Beth first. I think it's really about sort of co-developing and framing the research, uh, for example, with communities and NGOs that cater to their needs and with policymakers across sectors within countries. And then it's about sort of structuring science so that you're building capacity in those sort of one house sort of systems type of approaches and you're you're building scientists that have got um that interdisciplinary expertise as well so um yeah i think that those are some strategies we can use and gary i think in terms of food security we've finally realized that the whole world is actually connected and we need to tackle this um right across the whole world in terms of what we're doing, um, we're capacity building in Africa so they can they can develop their own solutions and have their own technologies and it's not all based in one type of country. But I think it's, I mean, in this country, we're finally woken up to the connectivity of where our food comes from. But it was a bit pathetic when we were panicking that we'd run out of courgettes a couple of years ago and the odd get is shortish. But at least it woke people up to the fact that we do have food that just doesn't magically appear on Mr. Tesco's or Mr. Waitrose's or Mr. Asta's uh, food shelves. And I think that's been a good thing that people are starting to think now where their food comes from and what it costs to actually produce it. What it costs the planet right, as well as what it costs uh, economically, right? Um, and while, while you're on, Gary, there's another question that might be a quick one for you to answer, which um, actually comes from someone anonymous on the Q&A, but is there current research into genetically resistant varieties of cassava that you were talking about in your in your presentation? This is where it's, it's quite amazing. Um, if your crop is dying, you will turn to whatever safe solution actually works. So whilst in the EU, in the UK, we have banned GM solutions, one of my own PhD students, uh, she spent some time in Uganda and she had actually planted some GM cassava that was resistant to both those viruses. Mm -hmm. So we have a very grandiose view in Europe. We ban technology uh, that could help secure food security, but other countries are moving forward fast with that. Uh, and I think that's something we have to look at um, in terms of our food supply. We tend to forget, I have to explain to my students what the term new potatoes means. Uh, they say, well, you get new potatoes all the way through the year now. That's because we grow them in Kenya and ship them over. New potatoes used to be when our old potatoes ran out and we had new potatoes. We have strawberries at Wimbledon every year uh, because that's when strawberries started. So we, we couldn't grow strawberries for Christmas dinner or whatever, Christmas dessert. Again, they're grown in other parts of the world. So I think we need to wake up. Uh, if we are going to tackle food security and diseases, the movement of these crops and where we grow them is incredibly important, I think. Yeah, and excellent hitting the target of mentioning potato in your answer there, Gary. I appreciate that. It's a thing from birth. It's on our birth certificate. You mention potatoes in every single opportunity. You <laughs> um, um, and I, I think this is a question for, for Rachel, actually. But but again, anyone feel free to chip in. I can I can see most of you to actually physically put their hand up, but you can also raise your hand in the Zoom. Um, what about extreme weather events and insect populations and their dispersal? Um, what do we know about the introduction to to previously um unknown areas or how that's how extreme weather could change that yeah i think it this touches on the point about how uh weather and climate actually interact with the underlying landscape and the combination of um environmental degradation combined with extreme events that can change um the shape of the landscape and we know that um vectors are their, their sensitivity to temperature can vary depending on the kind of landscape that um, the different breeding sites. So we're seeing, you know, warming temperatures uh, are changing the, the, the global distribution. So we're seeing um, vectors being able to survive in higher latitudes and altitudes, but then we're also seeing 
um, sort of changes in the, the seasonality or the timing of outbreaks because of extreme events and, and the impact of those extreme events will depend on the underlying landscape and how that interacts with, um, you know, uh, urbanization, deforestation and other land use changes. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I think this kind of follows on from that and is possibly a question for Tiana. Um, in terms of the surveillance, um, does surveillance of insect vectors show that they're occurring more widely globally due to climate change or the range is just shifting around? Well, I, I thought about that question and I looked at it and tried to look at it from the context of, of, of the OIE because we're not necessarily looking at the vectors themselves but really what's what's <laughs> what's emerging either in clinical disease or what have you um, so yeah I think what we what has been spoken about before sometimes that does uh, matter the climate does matter weather events do matter um, the um, you know humidity temperature that kind of thing does matter so if it gets too hot yes we might see a, a, a decrease if it's perfect temperatures nice warm tropical <laughs> feeling of where they're coming from um, you know we, we will see that shift um, in other areas where it wasn't so warm and tropical and I think Raman wants to add to add to the response as well yeah please do Raman Thank you. I, I just wanted to add that, yes, it is true that the range, especially for Aedes mosquitoes in particular, have expanded. And one factor which is responsible for that is the movement of goods. Mm. Aedes mosquito eggs can withstand desiccation and you can dry an egg of Aedes mosquito and keep it in, your, in a jar for one year, put it back in water and it will hatch. So this movement of goods, both uh, th there are several examples, I don't need to quote, have brought Aedes mosquitoes to new shores and uh, it has helped in its spread. And this is not only for Aedes alone, there may be other vectors who are also moving very well. There are uh, the movement of Aedes in uh, Europe, for example, the Swiss uh, university or a couple of universities have really documented that is Aedes albopictus is moving along with trucks and buses from Italy through Switzerland into Germany. They have put sticky traps and they catch mosquitoes. So they move all the time. And it's a very, of course, there are a classic example of mosquitoes carried in aircrafts. And we have airport malaria, there are dengue reported in um, Australia and so on. So they, they, they find various means of transport and uh, dried eggs is a big challenge. Yeah, it's sort of, it's, you know, we're the vectors as well, right? And um, Lauren, you wanted to jump in there. I just wanted to add, this is a point that's related and I think came up in a few of the talks, and it's that a lot of these uh, species, and I'm talking specifically about mosquitoes, it'd be interesting to hear from some other vector specialists. Um, a lot of the ones that are able to exploit disrupted landscapes and these sorts of conditions that we're creating as far as land use goes, um, are also the ones that do quite well in urban situations and take advantage of human landscapes. So I guess it's not even just so much that the range, if you looked at a map is changing, it's where the vectors are able to concentrate at a more uh, fine grain level. And it's where lots of people are and where there's a lot of other compounding issues. So I think that's a really important thing to add to that discussion. Mm, absolutely. Um, and there's a question, oh, sorry, Beth, please do. Yeah, I just wanted to really sort of agree with Lauren there in terms of um, with the, the midges that transmit animal diseases. Again, it's the ones that are sort of have become adapted to those sort of farm environments and the breeding sites that you might find in farms. And similarly, with the one with the ticks that are involved in transmission, it might be being adapted to the sort of cultivation that's now interrupting forest habitats and stuff. But also I wanted to make the point about sort of detecting these range shifts um, for some of the neglected vector groups can be really difficult. Um, often the surveillance for them is not really initiated until a disease problem arises. So it can be really hard to understand without those sort of repeated sort of sampling of sites over time to understand sort of how and why their ranges are shifting and, and sort of strengthening surveillance in some of the areas of origin of viruses and vectors would be, would go a long way to sort of addressing that over time. Mm. And there were quite a few questions on our Q and A about about preparing and prevention. So um, Laura McKenzie asked on the on the Q and A about what we need to do 
to, you know, when you look at sort of the, the problems with communication and risk communication in some parts of society during the current pandemic, what do we need to do to address uh, preparing for the inevitable? Um, an outbreak that you know inevitably will happen again in the future how how do we prepare I imagine a few of you would have some thoughts on that any raised hands Gary <clears throat> and Matthew I would do everything the opposite of what we've done this time round. <laughs> I'd, I'd in all honesty, we knew this was coming. I've been lecturing to my students for 30 years that we are due a pandemic. And they said, oh, you were right. I said, I wish it hadn't been, but we knew this was coming. Um, and I'd like to invite Ian to speak in a second, Ian Toth, in that we work in the plant, uh, plant health region. We try and stop particular pathogens entering this country. And how we tackle those is very strong and very robust. Uh, and I thought, uh, plant viruses crossing borders but I was in despair at every single thing we did um, many countries around the world was the complete opposite of what we do in plant health. Ian would you like to comment on something like Zayella? I, yeah thanks Gary I, I think in terms of plant health we one of the important things is that we do as a community both nationally and internationally work very well together so Xylella is a bacterial pathogen that causes disease in many hundreds of different plants. Uh, there are also uh, over a thousand threats of plant health to Britain and people work well together to know what the threats are and how best to tackle them and I think that's a really important aspect to all this. So thinking ahead we have databases that look at what different problems there are. We're trying to uh, create generic models that we can use when we find out some things across the border or is about to cross the border. So um, in terms of plant health, I, I agree with Gary that we, we, we do well to try and be prepared, although it's never a simple thing. Matthew, I think you wanted to step in on that as well. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, so pandemic preparedness or just preparedness for epidemics of vector-borne diseases or other diseases, I think, is uh, is really essential. And we have to recognise that it's, it's, it's a multifaceted uh, thing needed. Uh, we often come at these um, issues with just you know, uh, work in specific areas, but I think the pandemic has shown us how everyone's been affected and actually everyone is part of the solution. In terms of uh, vector-borne diseases and and preparing for those you know we need to as the question suggests recognize that there will be epidemics coming we you can't wait until that happens to start finding the solution that's become very clear from this pandemic and we need to have policy development in advance we need to have um, uh, vaccines for the diseases or, or uh, insecticides for the for the vectors need to be in either available or being developed and I think one of the key lessons from this pandemic is also the need to get our data organized um, for this, for the pandemic, you know, human data is, has been very disconnected and, and slowed down the ability to respond. Very much the same with, with data sets on animals and animal diseases, and I'm sure plants and plant diseases. And you can't wait until a pandemic or an epidemic starts to start trying to work out how to link one database to another. That's yeah. the perfect thing to do in peacetime, and we could be getting on with it tomorrow. Um, I just, I, oh, sorry, Rachel, go ahead. I just wanted to say, yeah, I agree with all those comments and I think we need to move from this sort of reactive to proactive approach and think about the, the co-benefits of being proactive, you know, things like improving environmental hygiene, all the measures you take to try and minimize the risk of these diseases just improves the quality of life in many other um, areas of health. So I think it's really important to recognize that, you know, the value of, of, of being proactive. Absolutely. And Luke, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, I mean, comparing with the, the COVID pandemic, vector-borne things are a little different because you have a vector as well as a as well as a pathogen, and, th and that's an advantage and a disadvantage. The vectors are really good at some of the vectors are really good at spreading some of these pathogens, and they'll fly around and you know just just sort of wearing face masks and whatever isn't isn't going to help. On the other hand, you can see the vector in advance of having the virus, at least in some cases. So. Uh, Raman mentioned uh, the Madeira outbreak. Well, they didn't have Aedes aegypti for a while, and then it was, and, the, and then they weren't at risk from those diseases, and then it was introduced, 
and that, that creates a risk. And similarly, you can look at those viruses and, and, and say, you know, are there UK species that could transmit them? And I think Matthew Bayless and, and some others have done quite a lot on that. So, you know, if the virus came into the country, would there be a risk of it, of it spreading? And if there isn't, then, then you're looking out for a vector that could do that arriving and until then you don't have the risk. So, so, you know, you do have a few more options than perhaps for a, a directly human to human transmitted disease. Mm -hmm. We did. We did have a question on the, the you just on that kind of preparedness. And you've talked to um, some of you in the, in the past about surveillance, um, and we did have a question on the Q and A about surveillance actually in the UK. I can't see it now, but I just wanted to kind of ask you, any of you that want to chime in really about that more broadly, um, maybe a kind of tangible example of, of you know where and how you would you would step up that surveillance to look for something you don't know is coming. That's Gary, and then Ian. Well, I, th I think Ian probably and I are probably thinking the same thing. In plant health, we test everything coming into the country. Um, and if there is a, any sign of a particular pathogen that isn't present in the UK, we ban imports from that. Now, I know human movement is much more different, mm. but we have a, a, a strong sort of portfolio of tools and strategies to ensure that we do not um, let anything in that we can. And that is all down to detection and surveillance, and tracking where it is. Even when we have an outbreak within uh, the UK, for example, or within a country, then that area, that field will be quarantined. And I know that we can't do exactly like this for humans, but you can see that surveillance and detection underpins an awful lot of preventing a, an outbreak or an import of a particular disease. I know Ian will probably say something similar, but much more, much more educational than I do. <laughs> Ian? Um, so I was going to say the same point. I don't, I don't need to say it again. But I was also going to say that more and more, particularly in the UK, and I'm not sure about outside, that we have um, people working on plant health and animal health working much more closely together. And we have groups set up where we can talk about surveillance and many different aspects together. And it's really helpful because in the past, we've always considered these disciplines to be separate. But if you've got a vector coming into the UK, whether it's a vector of a, an animal disease or a plant disease, doesn't really, in, at that point, make a big difference. So people speaking together across disciplines is becoming much more common and is really, really important. Yeah. Matthew, did you want to chime in? I noticed you've unmuted yourself. Sure, yeah. I, I think in this country, um, we have a woeful track record in surveillance for vectors uh, compared to uh, certainly our European colleagues, North American colleagues, and actually in many other parts of the world where I suspect a number of us on this screen and in the audience in the UK, we're probably more active in surveillance in other parts of the world than in our own country. And for me, you know, we can see uh, vectors spreading towards the UK and and some have arrived in the UK and for me this is a real wake-up call that we need uh, the policymakers in this country to be investing not in surveillance around our shores and across our territory as well as coordinating with partners in other countries so that there's really a global uh, approach to this you know the vectors are spreading in most parts of the world uh, including our own and I think this is uh, the time to really start gearing up our surveillance so that we can respond in uh, very quickly. Mm. And, and then of course in terms of, of predicting or forecasting that's that's where modeling comes in. I just wanted to move on to that um, a little bit for, for part of this discussion. So Beth this is perhaps one for you but how is there a link between or maybe something that you and one of our, our plant experts can, can shed light on when you're modeling an, an animal disease vector as opposed to a plant disease? Are there, are there lessons you can learn from those two different fields? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're definitely thinking about sort of similar pathways of arrival, um, introduction, establishment and spread. So um, whereas uh, plant viruses might be arriving mainly, plant pathogens, sorry, might be arriving mainly through live plant trade, then for animal diseases, it might be through animal trade, but also through natural spread path pathways like bird migration and things like that. So 
Um, there's sort of similar pathways. I guess there's sort of differences that you need to take account of in terms of sort of the host distributions and things. So, for example, something like Xylella, you know, is infecting hundreds and hundreds of species. So sort of thinking about where it might get to in the UK, you need to account for all those kinds of hosts. Um, whereas for animal, animal and human diseases, the, the um, number of hosts might be more restricted. I guess there are some key differences as well in the way we sort of monitor the pathogens um, and sort of track their movements between um, the animal and the plant health sector as well. So um, with animal movements, for example, we tend to be very good at recording where animals are moving up and down the country. Whereas uh, for plants, once the plant has arrived, there's not much movement. Once you've got a sort of EU plant passport, you're, you can move around then. Um, and so that causes quite a lot of problems, I think, um, in terms of introducing path plant pathogens into new areas. So, yeah, it's really sort of thinking about those human mediated spread pathways and how the traits of the pathogens and the vectors um, have an impact on their spread. Right. And Ian? <clears throat> it's interesting that there are many similar, as, as Beth said, there are many similarities between how you've modeled the two. But interestingly, think when, when I thought about this, we have the, going back to climate change, we have the climate change impacts on the vector, but also many of the pathogens that are carried by vectors in the plant world are affected by ambient the, the ambient temperature around the plant not necessarily you know it's not a like a warm-blooded animal where it might be more consistent mm. so you have to consider the vector and you have to consider how climate change is affecting the pathogen but not only that the host plants are actually much more susceptible to climate than uh, an animal and you have many as Beth said many hundreds of different potential hosts and they get stressed in different ways and different uh, conditions. So you have the vector, the pathogen, and how the host is responding, and that's going to—that's uh, a lot of modelling to do, and it's not an easy—it's not an easy thing to do. So lots no. and lots of challenges. And um, I can see you nodding a lot there, Lauren. I don't know, <laughs> agreeing vigorously. Um, I, I just wondered if you had anything to to add to that. No, I think that was perfect. That was why I was nodding so very vigorously. All <laughs> three, all three players in that case are sensitive <laughs> to temperature. Great stuff. Um, well, we've got so much, so much expertise on the screen just now. So I just wanted to um, ask a question um, of. I think this is probably one for Tiana and Raman. Before I go to a, a few, hopefully, quick questions of the Q and A, because I did want to spend the last five minutes just giving you all a final say, kind of looking ahead to COP twenty six and. Um, but Tiana Rahman, given the spread of diseases to new areas caused by climate change, what do you think should be the priority for research? Preemptive vaccine or, or treatments or mitigation, better outbreak control um, and better surveillance? So I'm, and I'm sure it's a, a combination of the two, but what are your thoughts on that? Perhaps Tiana first? Yeah, I think it is a combination of things. And what has also, um, been mentioned by our panels, panelists as well is this sort of one health approach. It's going not going to take one sector. It will take many um, working together. It's almost uh, it's it's required. Um, there's we cannot work in silos anymore. This is incredibly important. So the focus on on bringing the sectors together and um, each one of them has something to bring to the table in terms of solutions, uh, data, um, you know, ingenious <laughs> ideas. Um, so I believe that's, for me, that's one of the things that needs to be um, done. That's the first and foremost. Thanks, Tiana. And Raman, you're muted, just, uh, just unmute yourself. I fully okay. agree, uh, actually the Key issue is not, not only working together and integration, but I think uh, there are pockets in the world, especially the Caribbean countries, the Pacific Island countries, where mitigation is important. And they need to be prepared up front to overcome the challenges of climate change because they, they get lashed at short notice. And, uh, but if their capacity is built and they have uh, national capacity to meet any growing threat, I think this will be very important, the mitigation. And I think this mitigation is also a factor in several countries where capacity is essential. Um, thank you, Raman. Um, and 
I'd, I'd just like to go to, to two or three questions quickly um, off the Q&A. So I just want to ask you all to, to jump in if it's something that you, you want to answer. So Mandy Schaefer is asking, uh, what are the causes of the current West Nile virus outbreaks in Germany? And why do these factors not work in the UK? I'm not sure about the second part of that question, but what's the cause? Uh, sorry, all? maybe I can try to answer part of that. Sure. <laughs> um, so in Germany, um, and the most recent um, outbreaks was related to uh, picking it up in, in wild birds. Right, um, and another comment from Matthew? Oh, just a quick comment. I mean, the question seems to suggest that, uh, you know, we won't be having West Nile virus in the UK. Uh, you have it here. I'll put, uh, I'll put £10 on us having an outbreak of West Nile in the UK in the next two or three years, uh, because really? everything is in place for that to happen. And it's worth noting that a different vector-borne disease spread by the same vectors, Yasutu, um, not as serious, but still um, a flabby virus transmitted by the same mosquitoes, you know, was report, has been reported in the last two years in central London. And uh, that is a harbinger of, of West Nile to come. Yeah. Um, and one for you, Gary, from Andre Souza in the Q&A. Um, how do you see the world spread of other uh, viruses in other crops? I mean, that's, that's a big question. I don't know if there's some particular kind of areas of priority you'd highlight. I've already highlighted um, a couple, um, both in the UK and Africa, but we're currently facing massive problems in um, ensuring food security and also our environmental security. Our, our trees are being hit by a whole range of pathogens at the moment. We're realizing the importance of our wider environment. But one of the things is, uh, if we could get rid of climate change, we would still be facing this with an increasing world population. We would still be facing increased outbreaks in plants, in humans and animals. But that's, that's the last thing we need is climate change then on top of all of that. Uh, and it's incredibly important that we, we really stress this. If they get rid of climate change, we're still going to battle. But with climate change, it's going to be one hell of a battle, I think, going forward. I think everybody in the panel would agree with that. Yeah, you've got some some nods of ascension going on um, there across the screen. Um, so um, another quick question, and forgive me for not knowing exactly who to direct this to, can RNA viruses, RNA viruses, RNA vaccines, um, we've heard so much about those, haven't we, mRNA vaccines over the last uh, couple of years, uh, be developed against arboviruses? That's from Richard on the Q&A, and Luke? Yeah, almost certainly. There's, there's no, I, I see no reason to think that they, that they couldn't be. And they, they provide potentially a faster development route, not necessarily faster testing, but faster development of the virus. So, you know, we do have, for other viruses, uh, we have very good vaccine against yellow fever, and we don't have, and, and one against Japanese encephalitis, but, but, very, but very, very few. I would say it's most, dengue has some particular problems, but for the other ones, it's mostly a market question that there isn't a big enough market for a chicken gunya vaccine to develop one rather than the, te the, the technology is not there to do it. Yeah, yeah. And um, now we, we have a, a whole list of other questions um, that, that just uh, I wish we could get to, but um, but we do need to wrap up by about five two just so that we can do the kind of um, closing remarks and show everyone where they can find out more information about everything that you've been all been talking about. So I just wanted to spend the last couple of minutes asking each of you in turn and I'll go through each of you as you appear on my screen and um, what do you want to see come out of COP26 that's a huge question um, and if you want to sort of just divert that question and make a final comment on something you would really like to add on this topic that you haven't got to in this panel discussion then feel free to be a politician and do that um, but if I can come to you first Raman because you are uppermost left in on my screen and um, what would you like to see come out of COP26? Well, I really like to see a, a much greater commitment uh, on handling this crisis. It is a, it's a global crisis. And as we just alluded, we really need mitigation measures. We need better interventions and also a greater focus on urban health, which is, uh, which is uh, slightly ignored at the moment, but it needs much greater attention. Thank you, Matthew. I would like to see coming out of COP26, the first steps towards uh, deglobalization, 
to an extent. And I'm not proposing that we go back 500 years, but I do think that the rise in globalization has driven both climate change and also is a major factor in the spread of vector-borne diseases. And if we can simply reduce it uh, and then implement other measures, we can address climate change to a degree and also reduce the spread of vector-borne diseases. Thank you. Tiana. Um, a call to listen to your scientists and really put them first and foremost. Um, we have the knowledge, we have the, the imagination, and uh, it's, it's really time to make that part of um, public policy. Thank you very much. Lauren. Uh, very much in support of what Tatiana just said, um, but uh, I guess as part of that also give them the, the support and the tools they need to inform those uh, opinions. So I really want to loop back to a point Matthew made earlier about surveillance. Um, it's really important for places where these are embedded, but it's extremely important for places where they haven't reached yet. So it's timely. It needs to happen now. You need a baseline to understand what's going to happen. Thank you. Rachel. I think framing this climate crisis as a health crisis and really recognizing the health co-benefits of mitigation. Short and sweet, thank you very much. And um, Gary. As well as action, I'd like to see realization that this might be a controversial statement that the melting of the ice caps and the polar bears is, is not the greatest uh, 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 fear that, and problems we're actually gonna face. It's, it's gonna hit us on every, you've seen here from animal health to human health to plant health, but in all aspect of the natural world, it's things are gonna turn bad and more difficult with climate change if it's not turned back. Luke? Some better answers already than I was going to give from Tim <laughs> and, and others. Um, I think it, in terms of the, yeah, so sort of action now, I think the science is very, is, is, is very solid and has been for a long time. And then moving that to, to policy action, I think, is, is, is the key for COP26, although I am a scientist and not a politician. I have no idea how to how to uh, how to achieve that. I think in terms of vector-borne disease, you know, vector-borne disease is a huge problem with you know hundreds of millions of infections just for dengue and, and, and for malaria, and climate change will aggravate that and make it much harder to deal with in many ways. So there's an overlap between the two, although they're not really uh, one doesn't wasn't doesn't depend on the other, but. Uh, Vector-borne disease would be easy to tackle without that aggravation of, of the disruption and change from, from climate change for, for absolutely sure. Thanks, Luke. Beth? Yeah, I sort of endorse what Rachel said about looking at um, climate and health and linkages and co-benefits and really giving a voice to the vulnerable communities that might be really important for food security but are getting affected by these multiple stresses. And I think it's particularly important to think about endemic diseases that affect these communities every year and how we address those, even if there isn't a big enough market for a vaccine or we don't know enough about the burdens, how can we capture these burdens and these stresses on communities in ways that mean we can actually uh, put some resources behind uh, dealing with them. Thank you very much. And Ian? I think a start in the process for how we very clearly measure success in terms of climate mitigation against animal and plant pests and diseases, so that we're very clear about what we're, what our aims are and how we reach them. That's great, thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to, um, I'm gonna have to close this fascinating discussion. I think the time's really flown by for me because I, I feel like I've, I've learned so much. So thank you hugely to all of our presenters and panelists for your time and your insight and your research and preparedness and for sticking to time and being so succinct in trying to deal with complicated topics because I know how how difficult that is. Thank you to everyone who asked questions on the Q&A as well and for making this such a an interactive session that's I think you know that really um, helps keep this discussion lively and um, it keeps these events entertaining so it's really really great to see so many people engaged. There was 
One final question on the Q and A about um, about does the panel think that an outbreak is going to lead to the demise of the human species, which I'm just going to leave hanging um, there for all of you to to think about. Um, just a couple of points to make before we close. Um, everyone who's still on, you will please expect and look out for an email from uh, UKR and BBSRC with links to the recording from this event. And UKRI also has a virtual platform that's running over the COP26 UN climate conference period um, that includes events and case studies and lots of information there where you can learn a lot more. That will be posted in the chat, but I'm sure that will also be included in the email that will follow this. So thank you to UKRI, BBSRC for organizing this. Thank you hugely to all of our brilliant scientists um, and to everyone who came along and participated today and look at us finishing on time. Um, thanks very much and bye-bye. Bye, thank you.